new song. It's an old one, but it's a new one. Maybe it's some of us. Page 349 in this book. When you open that song up, if you know it, raise your hand if you've heard of it. 349. I'm going to see if I've got any students that know this. Anybody?
already a good Wednesday if we have sang the good old gospel ship and royal telephone the same night. Well, that is a home run. And, you know, that, that song. He set me free. We're good now. I, he set me free. We just might as well just, uh, we just kept singing and praying. Uh, you know, with a royal telephone, what a great song that is, especially with the theme of prayer that we've been talking about for so long since since the end of January and about praying boldly and, and uh, you know, uh, I've always said God's phone number is found this way, 1-800-I-AM-THAT-I-AM. And so, you know, you can find, you can always call on Him. And, and uh, again, as we, if, if you desire to be part of um, the 40-day prayer challenge, we're going to be starting that up again um, shortly with, uh, with groups and uh, we want everybody to go through it. I'm on my I'm on my 65th day of the 40 day prayer challenge. Uh, I said, "What do you mean that? I mean, I'm going through it the second time. I'm going to go through it the third time uh, because I believe that, um, that that God speaks." And me and my son Josh, we kind of a lot of times we'll share books or send them back and forth. So he had just got through reading um, a book on prayer. That, um, that he, he, he sent me to order, so I ordered it yesterday. That's another one. Um, and I, I sent him a copy of The Circle Maker, and I had to buy my copy of the book, you know, that, uh, that he's reading. Um, but, um, but, you know, Dad sent him the book. You know, I, I sent him a copy, you know, or I ordered it by Amazon. Dad sent this out. But I, I love resourcing people. Um, I had a pastor call me today. And this pastor, um, he was struggling with the thing that's going on with his family and so forth. And, and he's read the circle maker. And I told him, I said, have you done the 40-day prayer challenge? This guy's a phenomenal person to pray. He said, no. I said, good. I said, or just do it. What, what, what harm are you going to do? Start, you know, circling this situation in prayer and see what God will do. And already seeing God do amazing things. But tonight, we're going to continue with our series that we started last week on the spirit of encouragement, the spirit of encouragement, and again, it's one of those things that if there's anything that the people of God need now more than ever before is encouragement. People always need an encouragement. And Michael Allen brought forth you know, the prayer requests about um, the Jewish people, and, and we see that you read the uh, news reports and things of violence on different college campuses and um, people singling out you know the, the the Jews on those campuses and cities and. And we say, oh, I don't understand that. Well, I understand it. I don't why, because we live in a time where people hate people. And when you have hate, it doesn't really matter what 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 um, what brand of people they're hating people. Hatred begets hatred. But when we begin to pray and seek God, when we begin to encourage each other and, and things like that, that, that begins to break that down. And everybody goes through times. I can imagine if, if I were a Jewish person right now, I'd be nervous, I'd be concerned. And, uh, and I know we don't know probably personally a lot of Jewish people. I have a cousin who um, who practices Judaism and um, and she has children who are who are uh, who are who are Jewish, who are um, are half Jewish, and so by, by virtue of being half Jewish, that makes them all Jewish um, because they are the, the children are they're not Orthodox, but you know, I can imagine they um, or impacted, you know, by, by this in, in such a tremendous way. And, um, and so we, we see that, and then we see other things, things happen in our lives. Uh, you know, you're going to have ups and downs in your life, and some days you're going to be the encourager, and some days you don't need to be encouraged, right? Uh, and, and, yeah, you hope to have more days where you're the encourager, but it, we just, we don't ever know because everybody's got circumstances that they're facing. But when we want to look at encouragement, there's great encouragement that we can give to one another, and we should. But to me, the greatest encouragement that I find comes from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so, how do I encourage more than ever? How does God feel about us? Or how does God feel about you? And do you ever sit and think about that when you're going through a difficult time? You know, man, I, I don't feel like God cares. Uh, yeah, I was reading an article this week. Most of you know that last week, Mandisa passed away. 
a great, wonderful singer, had great gospel, um, some powerful music, and and um, and so, um, and I had to follow up on the circumstances, but you know, she battled, um, she battled anxiety and depression throughout her her life, and about ten years ago, she had a close friend of hers that died of cancer, and she got angry with God over that. For a couple of years, she stopped making music. She stopped singing songs. She was mad at God. And, you know, a lot of people do get angry with God because of certain. Maybe it's not because they lost a friend. Maybe because of circumstances in their life that, that they're having to deal with. Because some circumstances are unfair. But she, um, and, 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 you know, she went through that dark spell in her life, that dark time. But then she found out that God really did love her. And God wasn't mad at her because she was angry with God. And and I, again, I don't know the circumstances of, of what happened. Don't, don't, that doesn't really matter to me. But I thought about that. And I thought, you know, how hard that is. I had a friend who was a pastor in North Carolina. He's, he's a retired pastor. And he wrote a book, and it got published just before COVID hit. And, um, and it came out um, in June or in May after COVID hit in 2020. And, um, and I was one of the first ones to order the book, and I read it, and he had been a pastor, and he's still a devoted minister, and he went through deep, dark depression and anxiety, and just hit him all of a sudden. And his book deals with that deep darkness that people, and you talk about somebody that needed encouragement, because he's a fully, Holy Ghost filled preacher of the gospel, and he should never go through times of that. But guess what? We do. And if we need encouragement, but I love this encouragement right here in Isaiah chapter 43. And this, this, to me, this answers every question we need when it comes to encouragement. He says, you are precious to me. That's God saying, you are precious to him. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful to know that you are precious? Everybody say, I'm precious to God. You, you know, they're, they're, I, I want to dispel anything that you've ever been taught or preached to that made you think that you weren't precious to God. Because I've heard people say, and, and, and it's well meaning that God made you to praise Him. No, God did not make you to praise Him. That God made you to serve Him. God did not make you to serve Him. That God made you to do these things. Do you know why God made you? God made you so he could love you. Did you hear me? And that should encourage you to realize every one of you are special to God. That God did not make you so that you would praise him. God did not make you so that you would serve him. God made you so he could love you. Your praise is, 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 is his reward for loving you, okay? Your, your, your service is his reward for loving you. In other words, that you're rewarding God back because of the fact that he loves you. When there may be times in your life you don't feel like anybody else does, God does. And he tells, he's telling here, he's telling the children of Israel, you are precious to me. But he's telling all believers, he's telling everybody in you are best precious to me. So when I think of encouragement and encouraging things, the, one of the things that should come to mind is how God feels. How God feels about us. How God feels about each of us. How important we are to Him. I, I mean, it's one of the most important things in Scripture. Perhaps the defining reason that you're at church today. I mean, I, I know sometimes we come out of obligation. Sometimes we come out of uh, the fact that it's habit. But the real reason that we ended up in church is because... God loves us. And it's our way, one of our ways of showing love back to Him. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing for us to understand and begin to understand. And as you search Scripture, you search Scripture over and over and over and over and over, you find how much God loves you. God loves you so much He gave His only Son for you. God loves you so much He'll forgive you of anything you've ever done. God loves you so much that he will protect you, that God loves you so much he will provide for you, that God loves you so much that when man sinned, it took him, it took him about a thought 
to develop a plan. And that plan was, you know what, man, you sinned, so I'm going to send my very favorite to pay the price for you. Think about that. God didn't spend centuries thinking about it, um, Sister Sabrina. The Bible says immediately after man sinned, he planned a way. And that plan was, he already knew he was going to send his most precious one, and that was his son Jesus. And so, such an important thing. And, and, and when you think about the true God, the God that created the universe, that he cares so deeply about us, you ought to feel special. And that ought to encourage you. It ought to encourage you how special you are. And, and so that, that ought to encourage you. When you're struggling with feelings of unworthiness and then praying longer and working harder and vowing to do better, it doesn't always necessarily change how you feel, does it? Sometimes you can pray longer and you don't feel better. Sometimes you can pray harder and work harder for God and don't feel better. Kind of like uh, remodeling an old house with a cracked foundation. You can redecorate every single room in that house, and, 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 and but the floors and the ceilings will always sag in it. It's always going to be a house with a cracked foundation, isn't it? And, and eventually, what will happen to a house with a cracked foundation? It'll eventually collapse. And it'll, eventually, it'll eventually fall through. And, although, I mean, every house in Northeast Arkansas has cracked foundations. They call it gumbo. But, uh, but I'm talking about crack beyond repair. But what you have to understand, you have to begin seeing yourself as God sees you. <laughs> Don't see yourself as a house with a cracked foundation. Don't see yourself as you are now. See yourself as God sees what you're going to become and what you're becoming. You have to start seeing yourself. You know, God has greater plans for you than you have for yourself. So if, if I were to sit here and I'm going to say, okay, how does God see me? How does God see Danny Pinky? How does God see Tanya Pinky? How does God see Hope? How does God see Philip? How does God see Eddie? How, how, how does God see me? How does God see us? So how, how does God see us? The first thing that God sees in you is something that maybe you don't see yourself. Because sometimes we can be very hard on yourself. You know, God doesn't just love you, but God sees you as being lovable. Everybody say lovable. I'm going to try everybody. Everybody say lovable. lovable. Now, when we think about lovable, um, <laughs> I was in Walmart today, and I saw one of our little church babies in Walmart today. I, and so I had to go away. Not a little baby. Um, it's Jagger. And, uh, and so he's a handful. And so I had to go over and say hi to, to Jagger, you know, because you see that. He's got them cheeks, you know. And, and you see him, and, 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 and he's lovable. And I was talking, I was talking to his grandma and, uh, and, and, and talking about a couple of things. And she was telling me a prayer request about, about, um, uh, about her son and everything like that. And, 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 and we were talking and he was just looking at me. He was staring at me the whole time. He was listening to every word. I said, you say he listens when I preach. I know he, I know he listens. He knows my voice. Because he says in here, here in church while I'm preaching. And so I know that. And, well, he's just lovable, you know. Why well, you just love babies, don't you? I mean, don't you? Every time you see a baby, you just want to pick them up, right? We want to pick them up, and you know what do we do when we see babies? We pick them up, and we love on them, and we say stuff we would not say to anybody else. I think about it for a moment. If I were to pick up Jagger and Walmart, I'd pick him up and say, "Hey, you're a little fella. How are you doing?" You know, and things like that. But now, Sister Connie, if I saw you in Walmart and I walked in, like, hey there, Sister Connie, how you doing? <laughs> that would be weird, wouldn't it? It would be really weird, right? It would probably kind of, I, I, I guarantee you, I'd probably end up on Facebook or in a text, or in a text message somewhere. And, uh, you know, that, that would, uh, or somebody would be texting Tanya. I've had people text Tanya and Pat on the last couple of days anyway. Uh, that's just been people from Lions Club. But um, Sister B, they, te they text her about stuff I say as a hell twister. I got a little hat, some kind of private one. Uh, but you, you see, baby, well, well, you know, God sees us the way we see little things. 
He sees us as low. We don't see ourselves as low. That person's hard. That person's a challenge. That person, God says, I see you as a lovable person. I mean, Isaiah 43, he says, others were given in exchange for you. I traded their life for yours because you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you. Do not be afraid for I am with you. I will gather you and your children from east to west. What great assurance does that give us in the word of God? In Deuteronomy, he tells us this. Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him for him. He shields him all day long. And one of the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. What a secure position to be in. You see, when you pick up a baby, they feel secure, don't they? Because you're making sure they're taken care of. You know, uh, you know you're, you're, you're going to, when, when I pick up a baby, I'm extra cautious with them. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold them. I'm going to make sure that, 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 that they're taken care of. And, and even if, if, if it's going to cause me to, to, um, to, to, to have a little bit of a challenge or whatever. And, and so when we were pastoring our first church, at Lepanto, um, we we um, we had our the, the it was about a I don't know about a ten foot space between the parsonage and the church, and um, and the the church sat on um, on, on a conventional foundation. So you had a couple of steps up to get into the church. And the fellowship hall was right by our house, and on one given Sunday, Katie Beth was a baby. And, and I was walking outside the fellowship hall, bringing her back to the, we were going back over to the parcels. And I had on a, I had on a double-breasted suit, because that's what was popular back then, double-breasted suit. You heard of double-breasted suit, Brother Kenny. I tried, Brother Frankie did not know what a double-breasted suit was the other day. I tried to explain, I explained, you don't know what a double-breasted suit is? Let me explain to you what a double-breasted suit is. That was what was popular in the 90s, was double-breasted suits. And I had my really nice, I had a, I had a green, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a, um, a hundred green double-breasted suit on, and I'm walking out of the fellowship hall, and I missed the bottom two steps. And I had my baby in my hands, and I fell. And I had her in my arms. And when I fell, my immediate reaction, it was not to drop her and put my hand down. My immediate reaction was to turn so that I would land on my back and away from the concrete and protect my little girl. And, you know, and, and you know, the thought that I would got grass stains on my suit was secondary. <laughs> the thought that I would protect my girl because that's what, she was supposed to be protected in my arms, and she was. She never whimpered, never anything, and, you know, I was okay. I can go one even farther than that. I had a, I had a youth pastor when we were in Marion. He weighed 350 pounds. He was six foot five, weighed 350 pounds. He was a big fella. It's um, Danny Neal's son-in-law. You've seen him before. He's a big fella. Um, and, and old Mike. And Mike, Katie Beth loved Mike. Katie Beth was about, about two and a half at this time. And he went with me one day to pick her up from her babysitting. And so um, we went in to pick her up. We walked in the house, the person to pick her up. And, and, um, and so she went to him. And so he's carrying her out. And the people that, that were babysitting her, they had this big old boat out in front, front of our, my vehicle. And, and he walks in front of that, and he hits the tongue of that of the boat trailer. And he has my little girl. And this big 350-pound guy has her. And he falls with Katie Beth in his arms. And I look, there's no way I'm catching it. There's no way I'm going to be able to do anything about it. And what to do? He turned made sure he went to the back and kept on her and he got up, he got up and he said, all I could think was I was about to crush my pastor's baby. <laughs> but he did what he could to protect her because you would do that for, for a little child, right? Even that wasn't his child. That wasn't his child. That was my child. He, he, he would do that, but he did that because he was, God loves us so much. He sees us as so lovable like little children that he will do things like God's not going to fall. God's not going to fail. God's not tripping up. But he's there to catch us when we do. What a powerful place to be in. That's how important you are to him. And so you think about it. 
that, that, that he, he, he's put you in his arms to love you, but that love also brings protection. I take it one step farther. I think about there are times where I just put my arm around my wife so that she'll feel safe. So that she'll feel secure. And then when she's feeling bad, she can lay her head on my shoulder. And she said, I've got a headache. Will you pray for me? Or uh, I've got something that's going on at work. Will you pray for me? Or whatever. And if I put my arm around her, she feels protected and secure. That's the way God does for us because you're lovable. The second thing that we find is not only are we lovable, this is an encouragement. You're valuable. Now, how many of you like stuff that's valuable? You like stuff that's valuable? I mean, um, we all feel unwanted from time to time. But how many of you like it when you feel wanted? You feel wanted, you feel valuable. You feel valuable. Well, that, that, that's the way God, God wants you to feel wanted. Again, how valuable are you? He gave his son for you. He gave his son for you. Um, you know, when we, we, just to put it in a little perspective. Now, everybody has different likes. Everybody has different things that, 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 that kind of, you know, that, 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 that they like. And some things, you know, value has a different meaning for everybody. It, you know, some people, they value really high-dollar automobiles or dollar houses or jewelry or something like that. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. As long as we don't put it before God, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as we're not greedy, as long as we're not coveting something from somebody else or anything, uh, you know, we, we, it's okay to have stuff. And there's nothing wrong with having stuff. Um, you just don't want to put stuff above God. And we don't want to make a God out of stuff. But, but there, there, there are some things if, that, 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 that make value to you. You say, about, I don't know, um, about 14 years ago, 15 years ago, I had a precious man in my church order me. He, he was a pastor named Mary, and he's passed away now. His name is Charles Hogan. Charles Hogan ordered me um, an autographed picture of Arkansas head football coach Bobby Petrino. It sat in my office there. When I moved here, it's been sitting up on top of that credenza for, for all these years. I valued that. It's in a frame, autographed. He'd sent it to that, to that man for me. I mean, and, and you know, it was, it was you know, I, I don't know if he paid a dime for it. Knowing him, he didn't. He probably uh, sent the man an email and said, hey, I want this for my pastor. And he sent that to him. And, and so, you know, I had that on, on the top of that credenza. It was very valued in my life. And then April 1st, 2012, Bobby Petrino has a wreck on his motorcycle. Within a, a week, he's fired as coach of the University of Arkansas. He's disgraced and, 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 and gone away. And I took that, I didn't get rid of the picture, but then I took that picture that was valuable to me and I laid it down. It was still on my credenza, but it was laid face down. But see, in December, Brother Don, they hired him back. He's the offensive coordinator. Now that picture sets up prominent. It's valuable to me again, you know. It's valuable to me, you know. And that's, you know, why? Because his past is forgiven, you know. Um, and, uh, you know I'm going to assume he already asked God for forgiveness. I mean, he asked his wife for forgiveness, and he don't need my forgiveness. So I've got it back up, Sister Connie. It's up in a prominent place. I can, I, I, man, I, when, when I got the news, I immediately, I climbed up on the top of that credenza and I put that picture back up. Because I knew exactly where it was. It was valuable to me. It was valuable to me. I mean, I've got a, I've got a set of, I've got 12, I, do, I don't drink Coke Colas. Hadn't drank a regular Coke Cola since before Tiny and I got married. And I've got 12 Coke Colas in my office that are 30 years old. Two six packs of Coke Colas in my office. Anybody ever opens one of them, if they're from the church, they will be disfellowshipped immediately. <laughs> there's, there's an executive order. They're just fellowship immediately. They open that. 
Somebody comes in and they I'm, I'm so thirsty I can drink a Coke. Not that Coke. <laughs> if you're thirsty enough to drink a 30-year-old Coke, you are in trouble. Well, I got those. They are 1994 National Championship Coca-Cola bottles. Now, I, I paid probably two bucks for each six-pack back then. Now, with inflation, those two six-packs are probably now worth $12 because they're not worth anything more because of the 1994 Coke, probably. If they are, they're not getting sold. I mean, probably at best, they might go in a casket with me because she might be ready to get rid of them. I don't know. But, um, but nobody is. Do you, you realize, as a parent, how many times I've threatened my children's lives if they tried to open one of those? Because their grandpa loved for them to drink short bottle Cokes. And they thought it was ridiculous that they do not open those short bottle codes. I kept them out of I kept them out of harm's way. And I mean, if I ever see a little kid walk over by, that's the time you see me get a little squally. Don't touch it. You know, don't touch it because they're valuable to you. It's, it's the only national championship and one of the free major sports I've ever got to live and see in my life. And the way it looks, it may be the only one I'll ever get to live and see in my life. And so they're valuable to me. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, it just just two weeks ago, uh, another kid, I went on YouTube and I pulled up the national championship game because we weren't in the tournament. So I watched it. I watched every bit of it. And, um, and I don't regret doing it. Um, because those things are valuable to me. You have stuff like that. Don't look at me like I'm ridiculous because I have things like that. You have stuff that I've got waiting in your house, and if I if, if I mess with it, you would say, Pastor better not touch that. I'm going to another church now, right? <laughs> or he better not say something. I mean, because we have those things that are valuable to us, right? Don't think how valuable are your children to you. I mean, your children, as much as those coats are valuable to me, now I wouldn't let my kids drink them, but I never deprive them of anything else. And my children are far more valuable. That's why I love sharing prayer things with Josh, and we can call and talk about that. Or I love being able to spend time with Caleb or Katie Beth and, and what have you. And, and, and I love whatever time we get to have. You see, you find that, that value is important in, in, in all of us. But when we know that we're valued by God, you see, the Bible tells us in the Galatians, the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. I mean, that's powerful. And, and how many of you remember... The, what, what the slogan on Hallmark cards said. The slogan on Hallmark cards says, when you care enough to send the very best. Well, that's what God did, isn't it? He cared enough to send the very best. You see, the Bible is filled with the Hallmark cards that says, I care enough to send the very best for you. Because why would he send the best for us? Why would he send the best for you? Why? Because of your value. It's how important you are to him. That's what value is. It's how important you are to him. The third thing that we find that with God that should encourage you. God also thinks this about you. You are capable. If I say capable. Did you know that God believes in you. Not only does God love you, not only does God value you, God believes in you. There are things that I've learned that I can't do myself, and those things are the things I ask God to do, but God has gifted every one of us with stuff that we can do that we're capable of. And, and, and sometimes, if you will allow yourself and if you'll trust God, you will amaze yourself at what God does in your life and through your life because God says you're capable. You're capable of reaching to the, well, well, well Pastor, I'm, I'm retired. Pastor, I, um, I'm older. Pastor, I don't have the resources. Don't lock yourself into a box because of your age or because of your resources because you've got the greatest resource that you can have. You are created in the image of God. And because you are created in the image of God, there is not anything 
that can't be done in your life without, with, with, with the blessing of God. And there's not anything that, that, that can't be accomplished. There are things that you can accomplish that are amazing because God has gifted you with great abilities. Not all of us have the same abilities, but we all have abilities, right? Now think about it. Some of you have the abilities to, to play music and, 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 and things like that. We were in the blood drive yesterday, and one of the people giving blood was my cousin, and he's a pastor. And, and um, one of the um, guys came over to me, um, um, Ben Hubbard came over to me and said, Did you know that Brandy plays the guitar? I said, Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know he plays the guitar. I saw him on Facebook playing the guitar every day. I said, Cousin Randy is playing the guitar. And he's singing that. And I said, Well, I'm not, I, God didn't get me to be able to play the guitar. Now, he had to put a lot of work into doing that. He plays, he, he can play the guitar. And, and it's something that, that's, it's, it's an ability he's got. He, and, um, you know, I, I see these ladies can play the piano and things like that. If I sit down, sit down by the piano, I don't know what key is what, what means what or anything like that. I can, I can run my fingers across, but I can't make music come out. I can't do that. But now, because God gave me and allowed me to be capable, I can now sit in an airplane and I can pull a yoke back and watch a plane take up off the ground. And go up in the sky. And something that, that when I first started, said, there's no way I can do this. It's beyond my ability. But God says, you're capable of doing those things. When, I, when my daughter first learned how to drive, she would not drive over an overpass. Which turned out to be prophetic. But, um, but at the same time, you know, when, 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 when she finally learned that confidence and was able to drive, she was able to drive herself anywhere. Now she drives, um, she drives um, 30 minutes to work one way every single day. And, she's, and so, you know, there, there are things that we're capable of. What is it in your life that you thought, you know, I'm not capable of doing Well, just try. Just try to trust God because God believes in you. And that ought to encourage you because in 1 Peter, he says this. That you're capable because God has given you special abilities. All of us have special abilities. Every one of us. And, and, and so, and furthermore, he says he has set you down in company with Jesus. So you've got abilities. You sit down with Jesus and you've got abilities. And you sit down with Jesus, that means you've got capabilities, folks. Beyond your wildest imaginations. You'd be surprised at some of the things you can do. If you'll just let God work in your life, and if you'll just believe in yourself the way God believes in you. You see, this isn't a self-help message I'm giving you tonight. I mean, this is a God-help message because this is how God wants to encourage us. He didn't make us to where we sat down and watched Him do everything. He made us so we could be participants in this thing called life. Some things He can do because they're impossible for me. Basically, oh, there's some stuff. I give you plenty of stuff that you can do. You can do. And what did he tell us in Philippians 4.13? Anybody know? I can do all things in Christ. Absolutely. Well, if we believe that, then why don't we practice it? That's, that's, that's such a powerful thing. You know what? I believe I can do things for the simple purpose God says so. Everybody say, God says so. God says so. God says you can do things. And, and you'd be surprised at what you can do. You'd be surprised. And it may be the simplest thing. Up until Easter, and I don't know how long this will last, up until Easter, my mom had gotten to the place where she didn't feel like she could do anything anymore, that she was useful at all anymore. So she got to come to church on Easter, and, and she got here. All three of her sons were here. She got to have grandkid here. 
She got to have, she got to be around people that she loved. Oh, she was so happy. She's still bothered by it. Then the next day, um, they, had, they had already decided that one of her brothers had come in from Georgia. And so all of the brothers and sisters that are still living, they all met. They met at mom's house and they picked her up and they took her to Grecian. I went up there and met with them. And, and she sat up there at Grecian for a couple hours with her siblings and, and my oldest brother and myself and, and um, a couple of the in-laws and sat there and, and, and oh, she was... She was, she was so ecstatic. She's 81 years old. And she was just as excited as she can be. And, and, um, and then that she, she still had some things. And the next day, she said, I said, now, you go home and you rest because you had a, you had a long two days. The next day, she called me. She said, I feel so good. The next day, Sister B, she called me. She said, I feel so good. She came in here to church on this Sunday and she told my mother-in-law, she said, I believe I've been healed. That she'd been, she, you know what, what happened? See, she didn't think she could get out and even just visit and stuff like that. She had kind of given up on herself. God had I don't know how long she'll have that strength in her body, but it's been precious these last couple, these last couple of, uh, of, of weeks seeing her be able to um, do some things that you know, and, 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 but the positiveness, you know, that she has. And, and does her memory still slip? Sure it does. Does she, does she still have some things? Sure she does. But she feels so much better. She said, I believe God's healed me. And as you know what, I want her to keep walking and I believe God is healed me because it's giving her some capability. And she can drive herself to Kroger for the time being. And she likes going, now, that may not mean nothing to you, but my mom likes going to Kroger. Maybe. The next thing, the only thing she likes better than going to Kroger is going to church. And she loves that. But going to Kroger is like a second church to my mom. And, um, I mean, how many of you seen her in Kroger before? Go ahead, raise your hand. If you've seen her in Kroger, you, yeah. That's, some of you see her there when you see her at church. Why is all this so important? Why is this important to you being encouraged? For the simple Three words. Your life matters. Your life matters. The psalmist said this, I will praise you. Why? Right. Fearfully, wonderfully made. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Doesn't that tell you how important you are? Your life matters. Say it with me. My life matters. My life matters. Jeremiah 1 says this. What? What does he say? Before I formed you in the womb, what? I knew you. Before you were born, I did what? I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet of the... He separated you before he's ever born. He said, I already knew you, but he knew you too. Uh, I mean, let's go ahead. John 10, 10 says this. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, destroy. Well, what did Jesus say? But I've come to do what? To give you... Life and life more abundantly. You see, that's what you need to understand. You're going to have ups, you're going to have downs, you're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days, you're going to have times of plenty, you're going to have times of want and times of need. There's going to be positives, and there's going to be negatives. Your circumstances, they matter to God, but more importantly, you matter to God, which takes us back to the beginning of what I said tonight. Here's what God says about you. You are precious. Be encouraged. Let that build a spiritual encouragement in you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that is so life-giving. And God, I pray, dear Lord, that you bless, dear God, everyone, that they realize that they can be encouraged, dear God, because of what you think of them. They're lovable. Oh, God, they're lovable. They're valuable, dear God. And they're capable. And their lives matter. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you. Have a great day.